Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Henry. I'm Corey. And I'm Ryan. And this is Quick Study Weekend Edition. I am very excited that you joined us today as we explore the Word of God. And we look at the Word of God. That's the Bible. That's what we believe, the 66 books written by the 40 authors over thousands of years. Now, each of you have something yes. that you've prepared for today. <laughs> and we need to hear, Corey, what do you have? All right. Well, today we're going to be taking a look at the Tent of Meeting or Tent Tabernacle. All right, the tent of meeting is the place where they put at the center of the camp and everybody camped around it and that's what they did. Yeah. We're Fascinating about stuff. All right, that's good. Now, Ryan, you're studying. What did you do? Well, today we continue and conclude our study of the Big Bang Theory's alleged Big Three evidences. The Big Three evidences of the Big Bang? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. So in other words, we're going to learn that if that's possible or if that's even true. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. Plus, we're going to look at Moses, what God said to him. It is a good day to read your Bible. Today we are continuing to study through the Old Testament book of Numbers. Now a central element that we read about here in the Law of God uh, takes place at the Tent Tabernacle or Tent of Meeting. So you and I are going to be focusing in on this tent. We're going to be taking a look at some of the uh, possible Egyptian traditional connections uh, as well as what happened to this tent. In the book of Exodus, we're introduced to a physical element of God's covenant with ancient Israel. They were to build a tabernacle that would hold the law and act as a dwelling place for the presence of God, a place where God and Israel could meet on a regular basis. A meeting place or place of God's presence was necessary for the covenant for a few reasons. God's promise to be with Israel as his people now had a very real physical symbol, and the tablets of the covenant agreed upon by God and Israel were kept in the tabernacle as a witness, naturally judging the parties involved. Were they keeping it or not? The tabernacle structure needed to be portable in order to accommodate the nomadic lifestyle of the people in the wilderness, and a tent fit the bill. This holy structure is given two main names throughout the scriptures, the tabernacle and the tent of meeting, sometimes even the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. These dual names have puzzled scholars, but a good guess about why two names are used suggests that tabernacle is used to denote the physical structure, while tent of meeting is used when the text deals more with the building's significance. Regardless of its names, there is a bigger question related to the tent of meeting. What happened to it? It's recorded in 1 Samuel chapters 1-7 through 7 that during the time period of the judges, the tent was pitched at the city of Shiloh, but during a battle with the Philistines, the Israelites removed the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle and briefly lost it in battle. When the Ark was returned to Israel, it was kept for 20 years in the city of kiriath Jerim. The archaeological record and the book of Jeremiah suggest that the Philistines destroyed Shiloh, but what happened to the tent? It appears again during the reign of Solomon. We're told that the tent of meeting was being kept at Gibeon. And at the dedication of Solomon's Jerusalem temple, we learn that along with the Ark of the Covenant, the tabernacle was also brought. Where it went is speculation, but it can be safely assumed that it was kept within the temple.
Now, a really interesting aspect of studying the tent tabernacle and even just studying this, uh, this time period in the Old Testament of the Bible, represented by Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, is taking a look at ancient Egyptian connections. So what we would expect to see if these books of the Bible come from the same time period that they're supposedly recording, we should see a lot of connections to ancient Egypt, a lot of loan words, a lot of cultural practices that uh, date back to the time period of ancient Egypt and are very similar to ancient Egypt. Because this generation of ancient Israel, of course, was born and raised in ancient Egypt. So that's what we would expect to see. But there is another uh, relatively recent theory in scholarship that says, no, no, the books of the Bible, those books of the Bible weren't written near the time period of the Exodus. They were written way later. In fact, they were made up at the time period of the Babylonian exile or afterwards. Well, if that was true, what we would expect to see would be no, not so many Egyptian connections as more Babylonian and Assyrian connections and cultural references uh, because they're separated by about a thousand years years. Uh, so to know uh, detailed practices of ancient Egypt probably wouldn't be plausible at that time period. But what historians are actually finding is that the more they study Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the more connections they're finding with ancient Egyptian culture. You know, when Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and On took men with them against Moses and Aaron, they were wrong in their approach. Selfishly, through their desire to have authority, Moses and Aaron had, that's what they wanted, they were not willing to listen to the men who communicated the work and the words of God to them. Now, this rebellion spells out the selfishness of humankind and how we seek power over men and women all around the world. Well, Moses, however, did the best thing possible. Rather than challenge their rebellious authority, he chose to bring it before God. Now, this is an amazing display of God's work in his life versus Moses' manly authority. Remember, Moses had no manly authority. All authority comes from God. God would decide, as he had many times before, what men were in control of the messages and the meaning of what he would say. Numbers 16, verses 1 through 11. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near to him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah, and all your company. Put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel 
to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. Rebellion, that's the big deal here. Now that's uh, something that's significant because a lot of people today are into a rebellion. They're into, I don't want the man telling me what to do. Man, I'm going to do my own thing. Everybody's doing their own thing. And that is a problem because God did not design us for rebellion. Yet rebellion is occurring in today's scripture. Very important. Get your Bible guide out. If you don't, you can write to us at any one of the three addresses, Canadian, American, or the British address. Or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com, and click on Donate. Make a donation in any amount, and it'll take you to the PDF files of the page. Very important. Uh, the Bible guide, you can get a hold of it. And as I thought about this, you know, in our Works of Faith segment, I'm, I'm trying to grab a, a good headline. Really, there's only one headline. And that is the Great Rebellion. This is the rebellion that is the major emphasis that God pushes. Now again, they're supposed to be in the Promised Land. But 10 of the 12 spies they sent out said yes. They said, I think that we cannot do this. Two of the 12 spies says, we can do this. And so that's important. So they went with the 10 spies and the 10 spies and they end up in the wilderness of Sinai. It is a mess. In that time, many things happen. One of the things happened is a great rebellion. We're reading Numbers chapter 16 to 19. We're going to look at chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. And I find this fascinating. As we look at this, let's consider Numbers 16, 1 through 3. Now, Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Elab, and On, the son of Peleth, the son of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel. Some of the children of Israel. 250 leaders. Look at that. 250 leaders leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered together against Moses and against Aaron. And they said to them, you take too much upon yourselves for all the congregation is holy and every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? Wow, that's a pretty intense rebellion. Those who challenged Moses were many and made sense. But God chose Moses and Aaron. They're going against God. We must attack and we must acknowledge rather God's choices and we must not make our own. You know what? Rebellion occurs in the decisions we make. And those 250 men, every single one of them had to make a decision. Were they going to listen to Moses and Aaron or were they not? And the truth is that as we think this through, we make decisions every day in our life. Every day with, when we go to work, uh, when we don't go to work or whatever we do, we make decisions about God. And we need to understand that the Lord put us here to witness. And a big part of that witness is witnessing and being right and being understood and not rebelling. Not rebelling. I want to stress that. Not rebelling. Very important. Now we get at Numbers chapter 16, verses 4 to 7. So when Moses heard of it, listen now, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korah and all his company saying, listen, tomorrow morning, the Lord. L-O-R-D capital, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near him. Isn't that interesting? That one whom he chooses, God, 
he will cause to come near him. Do this, take censers, Korah, and all of your company and put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You shall take too much or you take too much on yourselves and your sons, Levi. Uh, he, he warns them. Moses' response to the rebellion was humility. You see, Moses fell before God. He defaulted to the Lord's, capital L-O-R-D, the Lord's decision. Beloved, we must listen to and follow what God says. Now, I want to tell you something. This is important. I have been, I'm a pastor of a church, me and my wife, we have been lied about, out and out lied about. And I mean, it's a good lie by good people. And I don't even know how it happened, but we've been framed and lied about many times. And you know what my wife and I decided to do? Just let God deal with it. Let God deal with it. We learned that from Moses. Look at this. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it small thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near himself to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to serve him and that he is brought or has brought you near to himself you and all your brethren the sons of Levi with you are you seeking the priesthood also therefore you and all your company are to gather together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? This is amazing. So we see that Korah and his followers sought the priesthood, not through God, but through human achievement. Beloved, we must seek God for the things of God. Many people today are seeking the priesthood, are seeking to be a pastor by getting ordained or going to a Bible school. You have to be selected by God Almighty. It is a supernatural decision, a supernatural selection. You are selected by the power of God. Thank you for staying with us as we continue to go through the Bible. Very important, very important, Corey. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we go through the Bible, because we are going to end up in the book of Revelation in several months from now. So this is amazing. On the next program, remember that we're talking about God speaks to Moses and he says, tell the children of Israel. God is telling us exactly what is happening. So that's absolutely fascinating. Anyway, uh, Ryan, what's up today? Well, the Big Bang Theory is the standard cosmology of today's world. And when one asks astronomers why they believe that it is the correct cosmology, they usually put forward three big proofs. First, the expansion of the universe. Second, the abundances of the light elements. Third, the cosmic background radiation. But are these good proofs of the Big Bang Theory? Last week, we discovered that universal expansion was not a good proof because the Big Bang was actually developed around the knowledge of an expanding universe. Well, today we look at the Big Bang's two other big proofs. When astrophysicists are questioned about why they believe the Big Bang Theory is the correct scenario for the origin of the universe, they usually put forward three main evidences. The first is universal expansion, the second is the abundance of the light elements, and the third is the CBR, 
or the cosmic background radiation. However, universal expansion cannot be used as proof for the Big Bang model, since universal expansion was already known about before the model was ever developed. Therefore, the Big Bang explains the universal expansion, but it does not predict it. The second proof of the Big Bang model suffers from the same problem. Astronomer Dr. Danny Faulkner explains. The evidence concerning the abundances of the light elements is subtler, but this too appears to be explanatory rather than predictive. The elements in question here are hydrogen, deuterium, a rare heavier isotope of hydrogen, the two isotopes of helium and lithium. Each of these elements would have been produced in the first few minutes of the Big Bang. All the heavier elements are presumed to have formed in stars. The Big Bang cosmology does predict the abundance of the light elements, but most people fail to realize that information concerning elemental abundances was input in creating the model. Knowledge of the light element abundances was required in constraining which subset of possible models was viable. In fact, small changes in our understanding of these abundances have allowed cosmologists to fine-tune their models. The third proof used for the Big Bang Theory is the cosmic background radiation. This does appear to be a clean prediction of the Big Bang model, since it was first predicted nearly two decades before its discovery. Indeed, in 1964 and 1965, it was discovered that faint microwave radiation surrounds the Earth. This radiation comes from all directions in space and has a characteristic temperature. However, while the CBR is a successful prediction of the Big Bang, it actually creates a major problem for it as well. Indeed, the CBR has a uniform temperature everywhere in all directions. But according to Big Bang theorists, the CBR's temperature in the early universe would have been very different at different places in the universe due to the randomness of the starting conditions. For the different regions to come to the same temperature, they would need to be in close contact. However, there is not enough time, even in a 14 billion year old universe, for the light to have traversed the entire universe. This is the evolutionist's light travel time problem. Many have tried to overcome this issue with conjecture, however with no consensus in the scientific community, this problem remains unsolved. Yet another of the many problems with the Big Bang Theory. As we can see, the only actual prediction the Big Bang made was the cosmic background radiation. And unfortunately for Big Bang enthusiasts, this proof causes a light travel time problem. And it's funny actually, evolutionists will often mock creationists since they have a light travel time problem. But they themselves have their own light travel time problem. The difference is though, creationists have developed many viable models to overcome their problem, while the evolutionists still very much struggle. I believe the Big Bang is a big sham. And I'm not alone. Hundreds and hundreds of scientists, both atheists and theists, would back me on that. Now, if you don't believe me, I suggest going online where you'll find a petition against the Big Bang signed by scientists, professors, and academics. A petition against the Big Bang. Are you serious? That is fascinating, you know, because I find that there's several kinds of people. There's people who are just into the pop science business and they just do whatever the magazines tell them, whatever science tells them, which is, you know, well, this is the Big Bang, the Big Bang, the Big Bang. People write about it in books and all that stuff. And then there is a, another group of people that are the serious scientist. And the serious scientist is not really sure about everything. Mm -hmm. And that is fascinating. Now, this petition online? It is, yeah. And Absolutely. it's signed by scientists? Yeah, it's signed by hundreds of scientists and academics and professors. So, I mean, it's, it's a failing, the Big Bang is a failing model. Really? So that is fascinating. I'm glad that I never preached a sermon on the Big Bang. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, there were times when people, I remember uh, 20 years ago when people were doing that. And mm -hmm. 25 years ago, they were preaching sermons on the Big Bang. Yeah. What is that? Anyway, that is fascinating. And so uh, we're in this time and, and it's, uh, it's very different. That's good. Thank you, Ryan, for your report. And I just wanted to mention to you again, we talked about the tabernacle, yeah. and the tent tabernacle. <clears throat> and you said, and the, the speculation, this is all speculation. We're not saying that. 
But one of the theories or one of the possibilities is what happened to the tabernacle when they built the temple? Yeah, a, a, a theory is, because it is mentioned uh, in the time period of David, the tent tabernacle is mentioned. Uh, aside from the tent that he built for the Ark of the Covenant or he set up for the Ark of the Covenant. So it's it's possible that the, that the tent tabernacle was stored in the Holy of Holies or even set up. It really depends on um, how big you think the tent tabernacle is because the Bible gives us dimensions of its frames, but it doesn't tell us how they were put together. So there is a little bit of wiggle room there, a few cubits here, a few cubits there, depending on how you put it together. So either it was, it, it potentially, this theory says, it could have either been set up in the Holy of Holies, or it could have just been stored in the Temple or the Holy Holies as uh, symbolically transferring uh, the presence of God into the Temple. Okay. This, this, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's a really interesting thought. It, it, it is. And this brings in a whole bunch of uh, things that you think through. Mm -hmm. And uh, because if it was, then they, they say that underneath the Temple Mound that they <laughs> found some things. That's a whole other That's a whole other theory. thing. You just but they a say, and, worms. I mean, everybody's looking for the Ark of the Covenant, which is no re not really relevant anymore to Christians who believe Jesus Christ is the... Very relevant to history, though. Yes, very <laughs> relevant to history, yes. And to the Jewish people. But we would technically, I mean, if this is true, we would find the remnants of the tent. Potentially, it depends on, we have to remember that uh, the temple was invaded and destroyed by the Babylonians. Uh, and they could have burned of, it. They could have, it could have been destroyed. It could have been lost. We know that many of the artifacts of the temple were returned uh, in, in the time period of Persian dominance, but then the temple was destroyed again by the Romans. Now the tent tabernacle is not an item listed as stolen by the Romans, but it could have been destroyed it could have been hidden it could have been lost we don't know this is fascinating <laughs> i mean there's there, i mean there's whole science movements on this so anyway that is fascinating and i just wanted to let you know that jesus christ is real and uh, the tent tabernacle and all that might be gone but jesus christ has been here <laughs> since the beginning of time and before beginning of time and he came and he allowed himself to die on a cross he allowed us to put him to death and then he he rose again with no one's help. Magically, it seemed amazing. And you know, when he did that, they were, he was seen in the flesh by over 500 people. And if you can think that through, I need you to understand, Jesus Christ said to you, to me, to everybody who listens, come to me, all you who are heavy laden. That means, you know, burdened and heaviness because of religion or whatever. And I will give you rest. Jesus said, I will give you rest. And I think about that and I think, you know, there's a lot of people who need rest. And he says, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light, I will help you understand who God is. And if anybody needs to know who God is today, many people all over the world need to understand and need to realize who is God? Through Jesus Christ, we can come to him and say, Jesus, be my Lord. I believe this happened. And you know what? He will do it.